So um, uh, before we do the meditation, are there any requests? I would like to think about this uh, three refugees, the Tanga Dharma and the Buddha. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, we can talk about refuge for sure. Yeah, I'll try and do it in a non-scary way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah any, yeah, any other things that you'd like to talk about this time? Maybe you can address that. I feel that this is a time because we were like expecting some new things to happen, you know, and, and, and by fact, we stay in the same limbo, you know, it's like you don't really know what is happening. Mm. In that in, 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 a, in a deep level, in a, in a, it's like you become a bit uh, indifferent. You 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 start detaching from from things in a way. You, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that was my lecture. Also, I gave a lecture two weeks ago about how to stay connected. How to to although we are in a way far from each other or and in this kind of quarantine style uh, of life, how to, how to keep ourselves open, how to be, how to not to fall into indifference in a way. Mm. That's yes. the topic I would like to suggest. Okay. Yeah, nice, okay, good. <laughs> we'll try. Um, so let's start with some meditation, just nice, gentle um, mindfulness meditation. And I think um, for this mindfulness meditation, we'll start with the breath and then gradually let go of the breath and just be with the mind itself. So I'll just walk you through the stages. And um, again, just start by coming to your posture, being with your body. Feeling your spine straight up and down. Very strong back, very soft front. And then mentally scan through the body starting from the crown of your head down to the tip of your toes, allowing any tension to dissolve as you mentally work your way down. And then make a motivation for this meditation that whatever inner stillness, whatever spaciousness and peace, may it continue to ripple outward, benefiting those around me. May the energy of this practice not end here and today, but be a continuous flow. and shift your focus to the breath.
Let your focus ride on your breath the way a surfer would ride a wave. Very alert and very relaxed. Riding in and riding out. All sorts of thoughts under the surface, but choosing not to give them energy right now. Just ride on the breath. There are external distractions and internal distractions. You know them as distractions and gently come back to the breath. And as you watch your breath, know your breath. If it's shallow, you know that it's shallow. If it's deep, you know that it's deep. Without any judgment, without any adjustments, just be with it and know it. Let it bring you home to the present, home to your own body home to the natural clarity of your mind. And then let go of focusing on the breath and just be in concentration with the mind itself. The part of the mind that is spacious and clear and reflective, sky-like, 
or ocean-like. Other parts of the mind will continue to operate like clouds in the sky or fish in the sea, moving parts. But the attention is not on the moving parts. Just observe without engagement. Rest in the natural clarity. And consciously try to keep yourself from falling into the movement of the mind. Allow it without engaging in it. and gently relax your attention. Okay. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, ideas um, for keeping our energy going during this time. And so we can talk about um, uh, refuge, it was one suggestion, and another suggestion that talking a little bit about 
preventing maybe disassociation and disengagement now that the novelty has worn off <laughs> of this new way of life and we sort of have some expectations that it would be sorted by now or different by now and it's not and how do we keep our energy up and our connections strong um, so it's a it's a really interesting place to explore from a buddhist perspective this concept of refuge is something that we talk about a lot um, for beginners and then we forget to talk about it all the way along the path when it keeps being really vital so it's something that um, even people that are not Buddhist or who have had a spiritual path for a really long time, it's still worth coming back to even though it's a simple concept because lack of refuge is kind of be part of why we lose inspiration. So refuge we would say is like an inner sanctuary or an inner safety, um, a deep connection with your own wisdom and an ability to then see wisdom outside of yourself and respond to it. So refuge maybe is similar to the way that you guys talk about idealized self objects. Maybe, you know, I don't know enough to be sure, but it's, it's, a, it's something that starts out as an external framework and an external sort of communication that you have, and then moves gradually further and further inward until it's something that is your own 100% and anything can make you respond and resonate with that sense. So for us, the reason for going for refuge or having refuge is a healthy fear of what your untamed mind will create. Yeah, it's a healthy fear of what will happen to your mind if you just let it keep doing the same old thing and the same old thing. Um, you know, if you just let your mind do the same old thing, it probably isn't going to get up to too much trouble because, you know, we're nice people with relative emotional integration. But there's a level of development that we'll miss out on unless we put effort in. And there's a level of peace and contentment that we'll miss out on unless we put some more effort in. So, you know, it's, it's a healthy fear that also I've made mistakes in my life, many of them born from distraction, many of them born from ignorance, many of them born from suffering. And those mistakes make sense and I can have compassion for myself and I don't want to make them again. I don't want to hurt myself and others. The reason I hurt myself and others is because of an untamed mind. It's because of not understanding the way the mind works and then not asserting a level of direction to that mind when it's applicable, when it's starting to go off track. So um, a healthy fear is, is one reason for refuge. And then the other is a healthy, what we would call faith, but it's really a conviction based in experience. Conviction based in experience, that there are tools that stimulate your own wisdom. Yeah, that there are external tools that you can take on make internal and stimulate and grow your own wisdom and make it flourish. So it's like um, you go for refuge from uh, good news and bad news. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, having conviction that there are processes out there that lead to greater mental health, greater mental peace, more effectiveness with others is really fast. It's just fascinating how many tools there are out there. They don't have to be Buddhist tools and we would call anything that helps nourish positive states of mind, we would call Dharma, it doesn't have to be Buddhist. Um, so, you know, a recognition of wisdom out there means that you have a certain level of confidence of your own ability, doesn't it? It means you have confidence in your own ability to see and recognize external wisdom as wisdom. You know, and so in uh, having an external refuge, you also need an internal refuge. And having an external guru, you also need an internal guru. That resonance and that collaboration is what really builds this, this inner strength and this inner sanctuary or place of safety. Because what you're protecting yourself from is suffering and negative states of mind. Yeah, so that's the place of refuge. Yeah. 
And so if you, you know, have a healthy, a healthy fear, not an anxious, you know, anxiety driven, neurotic weirdness, but just a healthy assessment that if I leave my mind to its own devices, sometimes it makes mistakes and it hurts myself and others. I need to recognize that. And also I am confident that there are external tools which stimulate internal tools in order to get out of those patterns. Then what do I go to refuge for? Yeah, what do I use? What tools or structures will I choose? This is the next question. And you know, pretty much, uh, you know, anything that is ethically based and has wisdom will work, right? So anything with ethics and wisdom is probably going to work for self development. So then, how do you pick? And what the problem is is. Um, our, you know, our ego or our um, false eye will cherry pick the parts from many paths that seem agreeable. Yeah, that seem easy enough. And then it will discard the parts that are challenging and difficult and uh, confront that ego or that false eye. So that's the danger in the fact that there are so many things that work. There are so many things that are effective. There's so many really precious tools in this world. And so from a Buddhist perspective, any of them are fine, but you do kind of have to pick. <laughs> you have to pick one as your primary orientation. And then the other ones you can still use. Yeah, it's not like you have to say, now I'm not gonna do yoga anymore because I'm a Buddhist, or now I'm not gonna use acupuncture because I'm into this Ayurvedic medicine, or I'm not gonna do you know, CBT because now I do psychoanalysis. It's not like that. It's not like you have to throw away anything, but it's about choosing a primary pivot point, and then everything else augments that. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a Buddhist, Buddhism is my orientation, but when I visit my family, I might still go to church with them, you know, and they say stuff that I don't completely agree with their word choices or their angle, but I can still hear the wisdom inside of it. You know, even though it's not my framework and it's not my way of thinking, um, you know, I can still use different frameworks and ways of thinking to augment and strengthen my own. So, from a Buddhist perspective, choosing a refuge is important and the refuge you choose should have some criteria, right? And one of the big criteria should be that it's um, unbiased or it's without partiality, that there's no sense of um, some people are worthy and some people aren't. It should be an equanimous refuge that is open to all and has a recognition that everyone has the seed of goodness, the potential for development, or what we would call Buddha nature. That everyone has that, but many, many different tools nourish that, and so we would never look down on another set of tools just because they aren't ours. But it needs to be something unbiased. So we, we, we would say that any, any religion, spirituality, psychotherapy, medical process, et cetera, et cetera, has to recognize that everyone is identical in their ability to achieve greater mental and physical health and mental and physical development. Um, so if there's a sense of um, special people, that's a little bit problematic. Um, so like that, um, and that it also needs to be skillful in that whoever taught the path, who, whatever path it is, it doesn't matter what path, but whoever is uh, the main teacher of that path needs to have freed themselves from fear. Yeah, freed themselves from the fear that comes from negative states of mind and suffering. So it, they need to have practiced what they're teaching, basically. Yeah, they, the, the, you know, the initial founder of whatever system needs to be using that system and for it to be effective. Otherwise, why rely on them? So for it to just be interesting ideas that may or may not work isn't quite a good enough reason to give your whole heart to a process from our perspective. It might be a good enough reason to experiment and try some of the techniques, but not in this complete 100% investment way. Yeah, because it hasn't been trialed enough. It hasn't been shown itself to be true enough. And so, you know, um, is it really efficient to rely on a path that's not clear once there's so many other paths that are?
So these are just Buddhist opinions, right? You can take them or leave them. But when we say a valid refuge, it has those criteria. So, um, you know, the, the technical way is, you know, free from fear, skilled in freeing others from fear, completely impartial, and will help anyone regardless of whether they are a kind person or a, you know, unkind person. So, you know, if it's something like that, it's a good refuge. It doesn't have to be Buddhist. It doesn't have to be religious. So uh, there's a figure that taught it. And for us, it's the Buddha, one of the three jewels. But the person who taught it isn't the main refuge. They're like what we would say, like the doctor who gives you a prescription, which means you have to acknowledge that you have some sickness. Otherwise, you won't go to the doctor. Yeah. But it's a, it's a good analogy, sickness, because sickness you do see as additional, intrusive, extra. You don't think of a sickness as you, usually. But negative states of mind, like anger or pride or jealousy or something like that, we over-identify with them really easily. And so to say, um, I need to work on those or get rid of those, it feels like we're attacking ourselves. When in fact, we're, you know, naming an intruder <laughs> or naming an illness that we want to remove. So, you know, so you are the, the person who is unwell with negative states of mind and suffering. The Buddha is like the doctor, but the thing that will heal you is the Dharma, which we are saying is like equated to the medicine. And, you know, to hold it in your hand, you see that it's there, but you actually have to take it for it to make you better. So the Dharma is the medicine. And then the health you achieve from that medicine is your own. No one else owns it. No, you know, you already had the ability for health. The medicine just stimulated that pre-existing ability for health. You know, so it's not like the medicine gave you health. Yeah, so just like the Dharma didn't give you wisdom. Dharma woke up your wisdom and then helped it develop and, you know, grow. So, you know, these, these things are what we talk about for refuge. And then the Sangha um, is the third jewel of refuge. And this is like uh, the community. Yeah, this is the community or the nurses. Yeah, so we have, you know, doctor, medicine, nurses is the analogy. And the nurses, they can be of the same level as you. They can be of less development than you. They can be of more development than you. When we're talking in like worldly terms, but when we're talking about like fully qualified Sangha, they should be people that are a few steps ahead of you. Yeah, uh, we call them, you know, Arya, Bodhisattvas, people who have realized emptiness directly and have Bodhicitta, whatever, that's a Buddhist story. Um, but to be surrounded by people who are practicing is the main point. Yeah, to be surrounded by people who are practicing. And so that's really important for us to look at right now because we're not really surrounded by anyone except for our family and our neighbors who may or may not be practicing anything in particular, right? Our family and neighbors might have a spiritual path, might not have a spiritual path. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. So how do we feel nourished by our Sangha if we're not around our Sangha, you know? And obviously what we're doing now is part of that. You know, we could say uh, in a worldly sense, in a colloquial sense, we are Sangha because we are looking after each other and we are um, all working on transformation in one form or another. And we are all working to benefit others in one form or another. So we are Sangha um, and that's incredibly enriching. And I think that it's, you know, it's not the main refuge of our three refuges, but it's incredibly important that it's named you know, in our top three, right? In our top three, the community is named as essential for feeling that inner safety. Yeah, feeling the inner connection with your path. The main thing, of course, is the Dharma, you know, your own medicine, your own health, but the community is huge. And so thinking about what actually helps us feel connection is so important because we tell ourselves stories about what is usually true forgetting that that's not necessarily the case. So it might be that what's usually true is you feel nourished by your community, sitting together, you know, talking about ideas. But is it the case that that always works or always feels connected or always is satisfying? Of course it's not, right? It's just one of the conditions. 
you know, it's one of the conditions. So, you know, some of the other conditions are just being uh, talking about ideas at the same time live, not necessarily in the same room or the same house, because here we are doing it right now and we're all each in our own house. So when we're starting to feel deprived or we're starting to feel burnt out and tired, it's worth just stepping back from what is it I'm saying to myself that I think I need in order to feel Sangha connection or community connection that is maybe not actually the case. I'm just used to it being the case. And so I've triggered a feeling of deprivation within myself. Yeah. So I've made myself feel isolated and deprived because my way of life looks different than it normally does. And so, you know, when we're in solitary retreat, for example, um, it can be one of the most connected experiences ever. And we can be surrounded by our friends and family and all of our loved ones and feel completely alone and isolated and alienated, right? So it's not actual togetherness that makes us feel togetherness. And this is something obvious to all of you, because this is the work that you talk about a lot is, you know, how to feel connected to each other and uh, how to help people feel connection within themselves, right? So, you know, to just sit with, these are different conditions. And there were even days during these same conditions where I could feel community connection, where I could feel nourished and supported. So whatever story I'm telling myself about what I need is worth stepping back from and examining with some objectivity. Because it might not actually be true. But because I believe it, I've made it true. And then I feel deprived. Right. So if we can just kind of take a step back and ask, all right, so, so far in the however many weeks we've been in isolation or, you know, haven't been going out to work, um, what are the days that really worked well and what were the factors in that? You know, and I think sometimes what we do is we try to negotiate with impermanence. Yeah, we know that things change moment to moment. And so maybe at the beginning of this like lockdown situation, we said, all right, this will be two weeks, three weeks. All right, I'll mentally prepare for two or three weeks. And now that I've mentally prepared for two or three weeks of that, I relax into that space. Yeah. And then it's, you know, two and a half weeks or three weeks or four weeks and your mind starts to freak out or blank out and kind of disassociate and get tired and vague and heavy and just kind of spaced you know, or it gets really agitated and impatient and thinks, oh, I'm just going out. It doesn't matter now. Oh, I'm just going out. You know, or you, you know, we start to get into these where we get either heavy and low or agitated and high because mentally we set ourselves up for, I can cope with this amount of time and it's this amount of time. Yeah. So we had negotiated with impermanence. We're saying, yeah, change. Sure. I can, I can be flexible. I can go with the flow. I can manage this new way. It's a bit awkward, but I'll figure it out. But because it's going longer than we thought it would, then the mind starts to freak out. So if you can just sit with what was your own negotiation with impermanence? <laughs> Did you decide you had patience and ability for this length of time? And now the fact that it's longer is, is that what's getting to us? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, if you go on holiday for a month or something, you mentally prepare for that month, don't you? And, the, you know, you pack the right amount for that month and you have the right amount of money for that month. And it may or may not uh, work well, but you've sort of created a type of flexibility within your life for that change in a month. And, you know, if it's shorter than that, you feel sort of, oh, and if it's longer than that, you feel kind of, oh, but it's only because you constructed in your mind a concrete idea of time. Yeah. So if we can just kind of like loosen up the edges of the, the boundaries and say, who knows how long this will last, we need to be as present as we can be. Because in the present, you can make any number of skillful choices. If you're anticipating and kind of really ambiguous future, then you trigger the paralysis of being overwhelmed. Yeah, if you're trying to anticipate what will I do in one week or two weeks or a year, how long is this going to last? 
How will my finances cope? Will I eventually get sick? Will my parents or my children eventually get sick? You know, what will I do if they get sick? What will I do? What will I do? What will I do? Then you wear yourself out, right? Um, and so to over anticipate in you know, a really ambiguous future, you'll never get that feeling of resolution of, okay, here's my plan. Now I can relax and now I can focus on the present. It's like we don't give ourselves permission to focus on the present until we've taken care of the future. Do you know how we do this, right? And so if you can just kind of come back to, we'll get through it together. We have to be flexible. Yeah, many things have happened throughout history that were unexpected and somewhat catastrophic. This may or may not be as bad as that. It might not really be that bad by the end of it, or it might be worse. Who knows what will happen? But, you know, humanity continues mostly because it's able to collaborate, you know, mostly because it's able to be creative and find new solutions. And so it's not necessarily our job to figure everything out and make a perfect plan for ourselves because we don't have all the information anyway. You know, so it's like, okay, well then today, how can I create that like satisfying feeling of what today will look like and then come to the present? You know, today is manageable. Two weeks is not manageable if you don't have all the details. So there's these tricks our minds gets into because sometimes you can plan two weeks in advance, can't you? No problem, because you know the basic variables. But right now you're trying to do your same old thing of, you know, plan out your next two weeks and you just don't have enough information. So the mind just kind of keeps going over and over infinite possibilities and wears itself out and then just, you know, blanks out into fatigue. Yeah, or busy with small things that don't matter or any number of really normal responses. So I think if we can stop trying to negotiate with impermanence and just be in flow. Yeah, be in flow creates creativity and flexibility and gives you your joy back. Yeah, it can give you your joy back. So this is very related to, to refuge because if we're seeking outer refuge, all outer refuges are imperfect and unstable and unreliable. Not now, but always, they always have been. Yeah, people are unreliable, right? Even if they're very reliable people, eventually they'll die on us, right? Situations are unreliable. We might have very good finances and very good planning and then the economy crashes. That could have happened a year ago, five years ago, 2008, 2009, right? So it's not like there's that much new about the variables. It's just that our mind is freaking out a little bit and still looking for outside security handholds. You know, here's something I can rely on. Here's something I can rely on. Now I can relax. If you have an inner refuge, it, it creates so much more spaciousness, yeah? If you think whatever arises, what I need to do is protect my mind, yeah? Because if my mind is protected from negative states, if my mind is protected from suffering, protected by my own training, then I'm in the best position to be creative, yeah? Then I'm in the best position to be flexible. Then I don't feel so hassled then I don't feel like I have to know everything already. Do you know? So, so whether we have a, a, you know, spiritual refuge or a Buddhist refuge isn't the main thing. We all have personal development that we've already done. We already have resiliency that we've already generated just from our life and the way that we've trained ourselves. That is a refuge. Come back to that refuge. Yeah, we already have an inner safety, which is our own wisdom which is still developing and still has work that needs to be done, but it's not too bad, right? It's not too bad, we can cope with this. It's just kind of um, reminding yourself that the outside things are not reliable and never have been. So stop beating yourself up and beating your head against the wall, trying to get impermanent things to be permanent. Do you know? So um, yeah, thoughts about that or um, additions? What do you think about this idea of um, organizing your refuge and connecting to your inner refuge? Does it feel like a useful concept or is it too 
foreign, religious sounding weird. I think it sounds very sensible. Sensible. Yeah. Yeah. And um, comforting, really. I mean, I suppose that's a pretty soft word, but um, it is a it's a it's a comfort to know that even when um, things are difficult, it kind of um, it's it's a stabilizing it's a stabilizing effect in life. You know, yeah, that um, you can yeah that. It's always there. And sometimes there are doubts. Sometimes there are, but um, going back to it, and you know, they say practice makes perfect. You know, keep practicing, keep moving, keep, you know, and, you know, sometimes I feel in my life I try too hard. You know, I try to push it because I don't have many years left, you know, and I want to do it all, you know, but just like knowing that it's there and that I can keep coming back to it and keep, keep it, and also keep it as a focus in my life. You know that the Dharma is, um, it is my path, you know, and it's a sacred path and it's a, it's a, it's a path that is sure, you know, and um, I can still question and not be a heretic for questioning, you know, <laughs> you know that story? I do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one of the things that I find the most comforting actually is that don't take anything but on face value you know you are allowed to question things you know which is very foreign to me or has been very foreign to me you know so um questioning and and having these doubts and being comfortable with them yeah, yeah. anyway yeah 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 i'm with you i'm totally with you and i think that um you know, sometimes we have to push up against our own refuge and ask questions of it and, and just kind of see, is it completely operating in a functional way that we want it to continue operating in? And, mm -hmm. you know, I think with, with all of this stuff that's happening right now, I guess it's just, it's, tri it's tricky to not get swept up in the peer pressure of everyone else's anxiety because sometimes we're doing just fine, but we feel some sort of peer pressure to be dysfunctional because everyone else is annoyed and freaking out. You know, like, am I being weird and disconnected from society if I'm actually coping fine and enjoying that there's less pollution? And, you know, I hope everyone stays healthy and I hope the economy doesn't crash, but look at the birds, <laughs> you know? And yeah something wrong with me that I'm coping okay you know mm. yeah. it was lovely while you were talking while we were meditating dating before I think I heard birds in the background from you and it just sounded so lovely yeah yeah anyway. hopefully you didn't hear the dogs barking I, <laughs> I usually have my dog here beside me but yeah <clears throat> But yeah, it, refuge is something that we talk about a lot in Buddhism, and it's, it's something that uh, Alexander Burson would call it taking safe direction. You know, what are you taking safe direction in or from? And the idea that you need to organize your mind in order to maximize your mental health, it's an interesting concept, you know, because of course, if you push too much, then you wind up... Um, hurting yourself, you know, if you put too much pressure on yourself, if you make it too tight, then you have kind of an inner rebellion that says that's too much, too quick, and you might even revert back to a less healthy state than when you began. So navigating how much training can you bring to your mind that is holding it and carrying it and nourishing it, as opposed to kind of squeezing it into some per impossible perfection. You know, so that that kind of self knowledge and then self pacing, because the, the main thing we're trying to do from a Buddhist perspective is create positive habits. Yeah. And so you're thinking about the legacy that you want to leave your future self, which could just be tomorrow's self, you know, what's the legacy you're leaving tomorrow's self by staying up too late, for example, you know, so you, you can think, all right, well, the legacy I leave tomorrow is that I'm more tired, right? But if you can think, what is the legacy I'm leaving myself for the next five years, 10 years? Of course, we think about future lives, but you don't have to think about your future life. What is the future life of the impact you have on others once you die? What's the ripple effect of your own mental training around the people who know you? 
you know, because you're leaving a legacy, a non-material legacy in your relationships, you know, every day, but also when you pass, you're leaving that as well. And so to also think about how do we use this current situation to model resiliency, to build resiliency so that it inspires the people around us. It's a big piece as well, but to do it with this really gentle pacing that's not putting too much pressure on yourself. Yeah. So the, the habit is more important than the success of it. Yeah. The habit of wanting to work on positive states of mind, on wanting to work on altruism, the habit of that is more important than being perfect at it or doing it right in any given day. Yeah, because that habit itself protects your mind also from disillusionment and fatigue because you have an inner orientation of what is the point of your life. Yeah, which you already had, but if you bring it back forefront and remind yourself, it gives life back to it. Yeah, any other thoughts or questions before we do little meditation? I want to say a little thing about in favor of, of the Sangha refuge. Because this is, as you know, first of all, I, I know Tihnathan gives gives it a, a very high place. I, I don't know, maybe he it's it's the top three of of course, but but he or, often accentuates the, the importance of the Sangha and uh, I can feel that during this last month as we you know in this and the association and this is part of the things we are we are offering the the the, the friends uh, to meet and to 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 go through this together and uh, even as I as I look at, at the faces of, of my friends I feel how my inner space enlarges, you know, it's, it's like, it, it's a, a, it, I have a physiological reaction to the presence of, of familiar faces of people that I, that I like, that I love, that I, 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 I like their company. So I'm sure it is, it is, it is a very strong component of, of keeping the the dharma and then keeping life <laughs> yeah absolutely. and yeah, you have a physiological response hey? it just kind of like everything relaxes mm -hmm. yeah 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 so anything you can do to connect with sangha feeling yeah absolutely and you know especially with the people that it's easy to take for granted like um, maybe your family or your neighbors or the people that you're seeing all the time um, to take a step back from your relationship with them and kind of remember remember their deep value to you even when they're annoying you and driving you crazy and you're seeing too much of them and it's like a little intense you know i was talking to my parents on skype the other day and they're both working from home and they have this you know quite a big house with many rooms and then they have a whole property with like horses and a greenhouse and a barn and it feels like such a big space. And then they're home all day and they're like, suddenly it feels like not enough space, <laughs> you know? And they have a lovely marriage and they love each other, but they're like, you again, <laughs> you know, all day, you again. And, um, you know, they had to kind of um, take a step back and like each go to an outbuilding and just kind of think about how much they value each other and love each other. And they're just getting on each other's nerves because it's all day, every day and um, you know, trying to work from home and the internet is not always reliable and the, you know, blah, 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 all the things everyone is experiencing. Even just naming that that's what everyone is experiencing gives you that, again, that sense of, oh, right, we're all in this, we're all in this together. You know, that the feeling of the walls closing in and the feeling of the people you love really annoying you and all of these things is so normal and this is happening to everyone. It's like it's not changing the situation, but it does change how you feel about it. Yeah, and it gives you back the Sangha feeling, you know. Yeah. All right, so we'll just do a little short sit. And so just uh, come back to good posture. And again, we'll just do some mindfulness. 
And um, I'll end with the Shakyamuni Buddha mantra just to kind of awaken whatever your concept is of refuge. So it doesn't have to be my refuge, just whatever your refuge is. We'll use that at the end to kind of feel like it is awakened. So I'll come back to the breath. And as you watch the breath, all of the background thoughts, settling, digesting, integrating, let them do what they will. Anything important you can come back to later. But for now, just breath, it's simple. And then imagine that your concept of refuge, whether it's some traditional sense, whether it's an ideal like compassion, takes the form of a warm golden light at your heart center. And this warm golden light at your heart center gradually spreads through you, nourishing your body and mind with those ideals that you value, with the learning you've already done, with the resilience you already have.
Imagine that you become so filled with this golden light that it goes out of your pores in all directions. And that anywhere the light touches stimulates the inner refuge in that being, nourishes their own inner safety, reconnects them with their own wisdom. And then if it feels comfortable, you can add strength to that idea and that visualization with the mantra of the Shakyamuni Buddha. Feel that golden light like a never-ending wellspring at the center of your heart. Nourishing you, radiating out, nourishing others. and gently relaxing your attention. Thanks everybody. Uh, have a nice um, day of remembrance and Independence Day and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you, Yontem. See you next Thursday. Bye. Bye.